Okay, we're gonna do our puja. Hello, Chandraji. Oh, you got a haircut. Nice. No, it's just inside. Yes, hiding. Okay, today we're doing purity in puja. So we'll do the puja, and I think we'll hopefully do a longer puja today than we did last week. So I'm. My intention is just to make about fifteen minutes or so, about ten minutes or so, of some opening remarks, and then we'll do the puja. So today I want to just start the conversation on purity regarding the practice of puja, ritual, etc. Because purity is such a central element to ritual worship, um, so much so that it can be taken to unnecessary extremes. So there's one trap here, which is becoming so obsessed with external purity that the puja never happens at all. So already it's a lot to ask every day to devote some of your time to doing formal, ritualized worship. You know, there's a lot of things to do in puja. You have to have the opening sequence, you know, there's Bhuta Shuddhi, which we'll talk about at some length, the spiritualization of moving up through the chakras. There's Manasa Puja, the mental worship of the deity, which we've said a few words about a few classes ago, but we'll obviously pick up again sometime soon. And then there's the actual external worship. And we're talking about not just a single deity, but typically when a formal worship is conducted, you, you first worship, worship Ganesh. So there might be a Panchopachara, five item external worship of Ganesh. And then there might be I, 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 that's true in the south, but in East India and in Bengal, they start first with the Guru. So you might worship the Guru with five items, then worship Ganesh. Then you worship a whole host of gods, you know, like minor deities, arguably. So you could say the nine planets, the ten directions of the Homa fire, um, the ten forms of the goddess, ten forms of Vishnu, ten incarnations rather, the Ganga, the Vedas. <laughs> like You worship a whole host of gods, and all of this is like preparatory before you come to the central worship, whatever that might be for you, depending on who your Ishta is and what day it is, and etc, etc. Anyway, there's a lot already to ask of you when it comes to ritual worship. So if you put on top of all of that, that you need to shower before you come to your mat, chances are you might not even get there. <laughs> so like adding extra stuff. Some people, they, and I think this is, is actually quite commendable, they won't do puja in clothes that are, aren't like gar freshly laundered garments. So they will never do puja unless they have freshly laundered clothes and white ones at that. Some even go further, they will never wear stitched clothing for puja. So actually it's traditionally the case that men will be shirtless for puja. Traditionally men should not wear shirts for puja and they should just wear the dhotis, which is a kind of unstitched sheet of cloth. Women would wear saris, just anything that's unstitched. Unstitched linen is kind of the rule. So white, unstitched, freshly laundered garments. And not just that, you can't go to the bathroom in those garments. So if you put them on and you're about to go to puja and suddenly you feel like I have to take a tinkle before I start the worship and you walk into the bathroom with the puja clothes, then they're in some sense no longer fit for pujas. You have to change your clothes entirely. So you can't even go to the bathroom with puja clothes. Um, you yourself, obviously, this should go without saying, have to be bathed. You know, often that means a dip in the Ganga or something like that. So obviously this can go to quite an extreme such that you might never even get to your puja. <laughs> So that's the pitfall. The drawback of this kind of purity practice is it can become too obsessive, too uh, fixated on the externals. Now to combat this, Sri Ramakrishna and Maharshadada unleashed a whole battery of teachings, you know, to help people um, overcome this fixation with external purity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's good. It's an intuition that you have about this kind of thing. So, um, you know, Ma Sharada, for instance, she was surrounded by a lot of like very orthodox Hindu Brahmin women, and they took this external purity to the extreme, you know, in many cases. So once I think someone had stepped on something dirty, or I think a bird pooped on her or something like that. And she wanted to go into this pond to clean herself before she did her worship. But it was so cold that going into the pond was like a real health hazard. But she was willing to do it anyway such as the orthodoxy of the Hindu Pujari, that she was willing to brave the cold of the pond over like, you know, uh, violating her purity principles, which I think is really beautiful and really powerful and quite commendable, no? However, Ma Sharada, spiritual consort of Sri Ramakrishna, said, there's no need to do any sort of thing like that. Just come here and touch me and you'll become pure from the contact alone. It's a very deep point there. Now, obviously, she literally told her to come and touch her. And that option is not literally available to us in person in the way that it was for that woman. But in the same way, one by thinking about God is in that sense, touching God, one becomes pure just by thinking about God. So basically what Ma Sharada is saying here is that internal purity trumps external purity. Then in another instance, someone was complaining about Shivananda Maharaj, Mahapurush Maharaj, whose birthday it is today, actually. So Mahapurush Maharaj, 
um, she made a point, Masharada said, you see, Mahapurush Maharaj, Tarak, you see Tarak, he walks right into the temple after petting the dogs. So apparently he like played with some dogs or something. And in India, dogs are not seen as very, you know, clean or savory animals. They're not really man's best friend, typically in India. They're like these cremation ground, trash eating, like, like, like raccoons, I think. Anyway, so Shivananda Swami, he's like playing with the dogs. And then he just goes right into the temple. And Masharada is saying that's because of his purity. He's so internally pure that it doesn't matter what he does, who, what he touches or whatever. I mean, his purity incarnates. So he can walk into the temple without necessarily having to take a bath. So notice, in both these instances, internal purity is preferred over external purity. Then in another case, Masharada was, uh, she would cook for Sri Ramakrishna. And one day she didn't cook. And Sri Ramakrishna asked, you know, why she wasn't cooking. And she said, uh, because I'm the time of the month, you know, and typically an Orthodox Brahmin woman will not cook during a time of the mother or anything like that. And, uh, sure, uh, and, but, but, and, and there, there are good reasons for this. I mean, for instance, like if that rule wasn't in place, then the women might have to work on a day when it would be better for them to rest. So it's good that there are these rules that say you don't have to do these things, but you can if you want. That's the important thing. These aren't injunctions or prohibitions to lock people out, but rather to help them, to give them a break and to support them. Now, Masharada wanted to cook, but she felt guilty about cooking, I suppose, because she felt unclean on that day. And Sri Ramakrishna very uh, 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 sternly said, there's no impurity in the body. Impurity is in the mind only, never in the body. There's nothing impure about the body in any of its secretions. No, there's nothing at all impure about the body. So this idea about internal purity being more valuable than external purity is key. It's a very important point to make here. You know, internal purity over external purity. So much so that there is even a mantra at the very beginning of the puja. You might hear it towards the start of the puja. that goes something like this. Um, Om A Pavitra Pavitro Va Sarva Vastam Gatopi Va Yasmarit Kundari Kaksham Sa Bhayab Yantra Shuchihi. Now that mantra translates literally to whether I am pure or impure, A Pavitra, impure, A Pavitra Pavitro Va, whether I'm pure, impure or pure, I might be pure or impure, inside or outside, whatever my condition may be, you know insofar as I can sit here and sincerely call upon the Lord, meaning if I can just think about the Lord, here it's the lotus-eyed Lord, which is a reference to Vishnu, Pundarika Aksham, Aksha, who has the eyes of the lotus. So if I remember the lotus-eyed Lord, um, Pundari, um, uh, Sabhayab Yantara Shuchihi, then I become Suchi, pure. Shuchi, inside and outside. Bahir and Antar, outside and inside. Bha, Yab, Yantra, Shuchihi. Inside and outside, through and through, I made pure simply by dwelling upon the lotus eyed Lord who sits within. So notice, even in the beginning of Puja, there is a kind of reference to this internal purity narrative that we're getting from Masharada and Sri Ramakrishna. There is no actual impurity in the body. That being the case, you can relax. It's not about um, having freshly laundered clothes or having taken a shower. What matters is that you're sincere that there is genuine longing to connect to the divine, that there is an internal quest after the truth. That purifies you. It's internal purity that I wanted to stress here in the beginning of the lecture. Because if we don't stress this, then puja becomes too much about externals and not about the actual puja. There's too much form and not enough force. So um, in some cases, it's just too tedious to do puja. So people won't because there are so many purity rules. In other cases, it can become kind of puritanical and people can become very condescending and judgmental towards others who don't meet their standards of purity. Um, so there's a lot of risks involved in kind of pursuing purity for its own sake, you know? And imagine the case of someone who externally is like to the letter pure. So they have taken their shower, they're wearing unstitched white garments, freshly laundered garments, you know, they've cleansed the whole room with Ganga water and they sit there in a perfectly neatly decorated altar and everything external looks good. But internally, you know, they don't care at all about God. They're not thinking about it. They may be thinking about what money they're going to get from devotees by performing this puja. Or they're thinking maybe it's maybe it's even an it, like kind of a adharmic puja. I mean, there's no such thing as an adharmic puja. Maybe they're doing some kind of puja, you know, for not the highest goal or something like that. So in that case, which would you prefer? The kind of scruffy butcher covered in blood who had just been, you know, working in the shop, entering into the puja full of like sincere longing and love and just kind of, deep, deep desire to connect with God or the person who inside feels absolutely nothing about God, doesn't care at all about the puja, is only thinking about like fame and money, etc. and who to the latter is clean on the outside. Obviously, the former is better than the latter. So of course, I've painted for you now two extremes. If you can achieve both 
that's so much the better. Okay, so now I want to change my narrative a little bit and say and defend this purity stuff. So in the beginning, I want to just bash it. I want to bash it because sometimes it's more of a hindrance than it is a help. I, I notice a lot of people, especially in like American um, yoga circles, they become very obsessed with external purity. Now, a spirituality amounts to, for them, I think, sadly, nothing more than just this kind of external purity, kind of I'm better, cleaner than thou, not holier than thou, cleaner than thou, purer than thou. <laughs> Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So Jesus, right, hit one of his beautiful sayings, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. He's not saying blessed are the showered and bathed and freshly coloned and nicely groomed, they shall see God. No, he's saying blessed are the pure at heart. So I think that's what we should prioritize. Insofar as we're having a discussion about purity in the context of ritual worship, internal purity is way more important than what you're wearing, whether or not you took a bath, etc., etc. So in any case, Ganga water has a powerful purifying effect. That's kind of the idea in the South Asian tradition. There's something very sacred about Ganga water. So if you want, you could purchase some Ganga water. I think I get them for like six fifty a bottle from the local store here. But you can order them on the internet or whatever. So the Ganga water is very powerful water, apparently. So if you just sprinkle a bit on yourself, that in and of itself is considered a shower. So in a pinch, if you don't get the chance to shower because of your schedule or whatever, and you want to achieve some level of purity, you can just sprinkle some Ganga water on you. You know, that's in, in and of itself a powerful way to purify oneself. Well, without even needing to take a dip in the Ganga or taking a full shower, and even if your clothes are not freshly laundered and you've been wearing them for like six days in a row, it's okay. Sprinkle some Ganga water and really feel at the core of your being that you've been cleansed, that you've been purified. And by the way, in the puja, as you'll note, as we you know um, go step by step, you'll note there are many moments to kind of create this feeling of inner sanctity and inner purity. Like during Bhuta Shuddhi, when we sit to do Bhuta Shuddhi, at the end of that process, you're supposed to feel that your body has been divinized and purified. Actually, you're supposed to feel the body is wholly effervesced. It's gone now. You're just kind of pure spirit. The body is now saturated with spirit through and through. Okay, so there are all throughout the puja opportunities to cultivate the sense of purity. But anyway, that being said, that being said, putting that aside, there is actually a good reason for purity. And I'm just going to make the case for it now. And it's this. The energies that you're, you're attempting to call up and harness and hold during the puja are very fine and subtle energies. That goes without saying. So obviously, some level of purity will be required to be able to even sense these energies in the first place. They're so subtle, so kind of ethereal, that they're even difficult to sense without a kind of calmness, tranquility, and purity. Obviously, internal purity matters more here, but external purity can help a great deal. So just think of it, you know, the way you feel after a nice shower. Try meditating before a shower in the morning, and then again, try meditating after a shower in the morning. Isn't there a clear difference? Like when you meditate after a bath as opposed to before a bath? Now, of course, some days, no matter how much you bathe, the mind is too busy. And other days, no bath is necessary. The mind is one-pointed and calm. But most days, generally speaking, these two extremes aside, most days, it just feels better to, sh to shower and then meditate. It just feels better to wear clean clothes. Doesn't it feel wonderful to be groomed and wearing clothes that you feel are pure and clean and, and, and you know, comfortable? It's just indisputable that purity, insofar as we're talking about external purity here, um, has an effect on the psyche. Isn't there a huge difference between walking into like a cluttered room versus walking into a kind of neat, spacious, clean room? So I've often said before that spirituality starts with the dishes in the sink. I can often tell the quality of a yogi by just looking at what their kitchen is like. If they have a pile of dishes or if they have a mound of laundry or, you know, if their house is in general disarray or whatever, already I know that I have to take several steps back with them and start with foundations first. They're not even ready to meditate yet at that point, arguably. I mean, I would say, you know, Swami Vivekananda would say, no, no, just go ahead and meditate. Just keep working and those things will come too. But Shaucha, cleanliness, hygiene. It's very important. Not for its own sake, though. It's ultimately a means to an end. Ultimately. And what is the end? To feel the living presence of God during the puja, meaning to kind of sense and interact with very subtle energies that are helpful and conducive to spiritual life. Insofar as that is the goal, then it cannot be disputed. Despite all of my opening remarks today, it cannot be disputed that external purity does play a role. You know, it's indubitable. External purity is valuable and it is desired. It is helpful. 
So let me just say that. But it shouldn't become a hindrance. It shouldn't become a crutch. So I wanted to just place these ideas before you. And you have to kind of adjust them suiting your own to suit your own temperament and your own like time and schedule. Obviously, a, a dirty puja in the least like dishes and all, like obviously a puja, even in the midst of that is better than no puja at all. Obviously, meditation um, in dirty clothes, feeling crummy and just grimy and a, a, a bombed out house is better than no meditation at all. So if the comparison is between doing it and not doing it, then doing it in any way is preferable to not doing it. But if the comparison is between doing it and doing it well, then as far as possible, let's do it, do it well. That's all I would have to say with regards to the, let's call it purity spectrum. To what degree, where do you fall on the spectrum of purity? <laughs> like that. And you know, the thing is, I think a lot of that will also depend on how much internal help you have. Some people are so strong internally, they actually don't need a lot of, like Swami Vivekananda, for instance. You know, Sri Ramakrishna actually literally said in one part of the gospel, I kid you not, he said of the rishis that they could eat pork if they wanted to, which for an Indian is quite the statement, right? He's saying they could do that because they had such strong discernment within, meaning they didn't need any help from external forms of purity. Swami Vivekananda himself would eat meat. Um, I mean, though he did advocate vegetarianism, he himself ate meat. And he... Uh, would kind of sometimes condescendingly say, what is this, a kitchen religion or something like that? Because he knew that religion wasn't about food. It was about spirituality. It's not about food. Anyway, in any case, um, Swamiji, Sri Ramakrishna would just give him whatever to eat, knowing that he was so strong internally that he didn't need external help. So it's different for all of us, right? Some people have so much going on for them internally that they don't, it's superfluous at that point. But most of us, let's not overestimate our ability. Let's do our best. Insofar as purity is concerned, let's do our best. So here's a checklist a purity checklist for doing puja. It's very kind of simple. Um, and any and all of these can be used for the puja. The first is to generally have that light sense in the body, a kind of fresh sense in the body. Typically, a vegetarian diet um, is, is preferred, but not necessary at all. What is necessary, though, is some space between the last meal and the puja. You know, so don't get the idea that only if you're eating vegetarian food, you can do puja. In fact, that narrative has been in many places pushed, right? Like Brahmins would say, no, unless you're on like a Brahmin diet, vegetarian, there's no right, you have no right to do puja. Like that, you'll hear things like this. I don't believe in that at all. Um, some of the greatest pujaris of our nation and in the world have been meat eaters, the Tibetan Buddhist, for instance. So I wouldn't say this. I would just say that when, when you fast a little bit, like an hour or two even, you know, it's kind of good. So maybe if you do puja in the morning before breakfast and then eat breakfast and do puja, compare the difference. You might notice there's a kind of lightness that's preferred for puja. Not always though, since I have a vata constitution, it helps me to eat and be grounded. If I fast, then I notice because of the vata constitution, um, it, it becomes spacey for me actually, and not as deep as it could be if I had nourished myself with some food. So although in general, fasting a little bit before doing puja, like just two or three hours before puja can be very helpful. Yeah, puja before breakfast. I typically like to practice first thing in the morning before breakfast, and I find that it's very deep. So this is always going to be, you know, like as, as far as these food rules are concerned, it's always going to be up to you and your um own prakriti it's called your own constitution because i'm very vata like a little bit of fasting works for me um but i i wouldn't really fast like for a whole day or anything like that typically not not right now that's not what i do but i would just say the the first kind of consideration is just a little bit of space between your last meal and the puja can be quite helpful to have that light kind of feeling that's conducive to you know spiritual vibrations the first thing second thing is a shower or a bath of any sort so just taking a bath, the water can kind of cool you down, calm you out, and give you a sense of being cleansed and fresh and pure. So the third thing, so I'll just put, put here, cool belly. I'll just put that there. Uh, Swami Chetan Ananda used that joke. Cool belly, which I think he meant even if you're eating, eat light foods, light and digestible, nourishing foods. Cool belly. Then uh, bath. The third thing is fresh clothes. Now, they don't have to be freshly laundered. Ideally, they are, um, but they don't have to be. I almost never follow that rule. I just like to wear clean clothes um, after a bath. But if you do have freshly laundered ritual clothes that you just use for the rituals, then sure. If they're white, so much the better. Whatever, you know, um, fresh clothes. The fourth thing is to light incense and greet all the deities. So this is very purifying too, just to kind of have incense going purifies the space. So I would typically, as I come into the puja space, light incense. Uh, I, I guess first thing to do is light the fire, the main fire that you're going to be using for the puja. Then you light the incense and then just do a little bit of, you know, 
um, greeting of all the various deities. You might even take pranam as you enter the room, do a little greeting, just kind of say hello to all the deities that you have in your space or just the main deity or just light the incense and leave it there. So it's also very cleansing. Then you can sprinkle a bit of Ganga water if you have it around you. That's also a good idea. Just splash Ganga water all over. Just kind of sprinkle, sprinkle, sprinkle. Maybe even using a flower to sprinkle it. And having sprinkled Ganga water around the room, now you should get this sense of like, ah, the, the space is pure and cleansed and clean. Now, this is the most important thing. I guess I should put that in the chat. Uh, light incense, greet the deities. Five, sprinkle Ganga water. And then, okay, actually, you know, maybe I'll add a sixth thing. Sixth thing is arrange slash decorate the altar. So, this could mean, and I'll just add as an addendum here, 6.1, um, wipe down images, uh, uh, statues, etc. So maybe you have a little clean cloth. You might put a little Ganga water on the cloth and just wipe down the various images that you're going to be worshipping. Pictures, maybe wipe down the murti or something like that. 6.2, arrange flowers and leaves. So make sure there's no like leftover flowers from the previous days, puja, unless they're still fresh and you're leaving them there intentionally, like as you can see here. Or, you know, just when you have some leaves or flowers that you want to decorate the altar with, just decorate. So start by decorating the altar. Then, and I think this is the most important, I'll put it as seven, meditate slash pray slash japa. This is, I think, the most important. Say you've missed everything from steps one through six. If you just do step seven, your puja will be very charged and beautiful. If you skip step seven, then your puja might be a little compromised because you haven't entered the zone. So step seven is meditate, do a little japa or pray, any and all of these things, just to get into the right headspace, to get into the zone. No, so now, just to kind of complete this, this discussion, all seven things as a kind of checklist for purity, keeping it as light as possible, uh, pardon the pun, is a cool belly. Have a little space between the last meal and the puja. Two, take a bath, have a shower, um, refresh the body. Three, fresh clothes. Freshly laundered would be ideal, but if not, don't worry about that. Don't obsess over it. Just fresh, clean clothes that you feel comfortable and nice in. Four, light some incense. You know, and maybe make some pranams as part of that. Five, sprinkle a little Ganga water if you have any around the room. A little holy water if you want. Um, six, arrange and decorate the altar if you're using some flowers, some leaves, wipe down the images, etc. Um, and then finally, seven, maybe the most important thing is just meditate. Pray for a bit. Do a little japa. Just kind of like arrive there. It could be two minutes. It could be one minute. It could be 30 seconds. It could be 20 minutes. It could be an hour. Whatever this spirit is, it's actually very powerful. Um, it just changes the vibe of the whole puja throughout the rest of the evening. So I'll just put that there for now. Let's start the puja, okay? I'll turn off the recording and then we'll do the puja. You can follow along if you're practicing and just meditate also if you want. <laughs> 